Some of us are outwardly successful, but inwardly feel unhappy and living a life lacking in purpose and meaning. The Necktie and the Jaguar by Carl Greer can help you discover what's important to you and how to go for it. For more information or to purchase the book, visit carlgreer.com. That's C-A-R-L-G-R-E-E-R.com. Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. So I'm going to just expand it for a moment because I think this is a situation that applies to a lot of people in the core issue. We have loved ones, particularly when there are children, but I think it also applies for children to their parents as their parents age of a sense of, I should be able to provide for them more than I'm able to. I imagine sometimes spouses also feel this for each other. I should somehow, what they're asking is not unreasonable. She wants to move closer to home, but it's more expensive. But I should be able to provide that. And there's this sense of guilt, as you say that I'm somehow a failure as a mother to not be able to provide that. And what I would say to you is that as a mother, what she needs from you more than anything is to learn how to honestly and courageously take responsibility for our own lives. That if what if what she learns is, because obviously when it doesn't happen, when you make a promise and you can't fulfill it, well, she knows that you haven't been able to fulfill it. So what she learns in that way is, rather than honestly assessing a situation, rather than honestly realizing that the present moment, even in its lack, lack of enough money, lack of enough health, lack of enough opportunity. So many different lacks that in so many situations we face. It's the absolute reality of so many people's world today. That in that situation, A, it's something we should feel badly about, therefore we lie or may make false promises. And that rather than honestly assessing it and figuring out, okay, what to do about it, somehow if we pretend that it isn't a problem, it'll go away. And that's actually a really detrimental lesson to be teaching her. And as a daughter, even though she may be saying to you, Mom, what I want from you is for you to give me enough money so I can move back closer to home, on a deep level, what she really needs from you is, Mom, I want you to teach me how with grace and stability and perseverance, and surrender, and even joy and acceptance. I can continue to live where I'm living because we don't have the money for me to move closer to home. 
because this is only the first of so many things in my life that are not going to go exactly the way I want them to go. I mean, that's a lesson that's really better off learned sooner rather than later. Because not everything in our life, particularly things related to money and opportunity and ease and comfort and luxury and accessibility, that stuff doesn't go our way. And the sooner that we learn that actually there's a greater gift in that acceptance. And that doesn't mean by the way that we give up. It doesn't mean that if we're in a situation where there's lack that we say, oh, okay, this is all that I'm deserving of, this is fine. It's not that. We hold out the vision the expectation even of full abundance, overflowing abundance and prosperity in the future. But we also stay grounded in the real. This is, this is a real and ideal <coughs> marriage. So it's not a matter of I give up and I say, okay, so I'm never going to have enough money. I'm never going to be able to do what I want now. I hold out the ideal. That's why she's in school. Presumably by when she graduates, she'll have a degree. She'll get a job. She'll be able to do better. She'll make money. I mean, this is why people sit through classes that they're not interested in for many, many hours, for many, many years, because it's, it's a vision. It's a vision of, I will sacrifice in the short term in order that in the long term, I will have this piece of paper in exchange for all these hours I've spent sitting in class, I'll get a piece of paper. That piece of paper will give me opportunity. That piece of paper will open doors, careers, jobs, vocations, whatever it is, that therefore I will make money and have opportunities. That's why people do that. Otherwise, why would people spend so many years spending all the hours of their day sitting in, cl sitting in classes they weren't interested. So at some point in the future, presumably, she will have the money to do with it whatever she wants. But at the moment, the lesson for you to teach her is that this is a wonderful opportunity to find peace, and find an experience of inner abundance. Even if there's something she wants externally that's not happening her way. There's a beautiful teaching. There was a, an incredible saint who used to live right across Ganga from us, Swami Dayanandji Maharaj, who <coughs> left his body a few years ago. And he used to say, and I hold this very dear to my heart and share it frequently, he used to say, the only definition of success that matters at all, he would say, I don't care how much you make, I don't care what your title is, I don't care any of that. The only definition of success that matters is how you respond to the inevitable times. Inevitable times. They happen to everybody. Inevitable times when the universe does not act the way you think it should. I'll give that again. Success is how you respond to the inevitable times when the universe does not act the way you think it should. And so this is a perfect opportunity for her to learn and for you to model this, this success. The universe is not acting the way you think it should. There isn't enough money in the bank for her to move close to home while still being in school. What a wonderful opportunity to learn about a different model of success. 
not to be bitter, not to be resentful, but of course to keep holding out the vision, the expectation, the manifestation of the abundance, while simultaneously knowing in this present moment everything is exactly right. Whether I'm five kilometers from home or 50 kilometers from home or 500 kilometers from my mom's home, this moment is exactly perfect. And that's what she needs from you in this moment. So stop telling her things that aren't true. A, it makes you feel horribly guilty, which then is not only unfair to you, but it's actually a lie to you. So it's two lies. One is the lie to your daughter. Yes, yes, we'll make it happen. But the other is the lie to you, which is that guilt which says to you, you are a bad mom. Because you're not a bad mom. The mark of a good mom is not one who has enough money that her daughter can live close to home. There's no book that that's written in the list of criteria for a good mom. So every time you have guilt, that is a lie to you. And that's not fair. Because that is an absolute untruth that you tell yourself, but you set yourself up for it. Because first you tell your daughter an untruth that you know isn't true. And then you allow yourself to drown in the guilt of feeling like a bad mother for not providing something. there isn't any need to provide anyway. Sure, if you had it, great, you'd give it to her. You don't have it, you can't give it to her. At some point she'll earn it, or it'll come, or she won't. And then you'll figure it out. But none of that makes you a bad mother. Yeah, model f- model for her an acknowledgement of the reality of the situation with peace, with acceptance, with embrace, with knowing it's exactly perfect in this moment, while also holding out this vision and working toward it. Yeah. It's important because we all make different decisions in our lives. And if you had made a different decision 20 years ago, you might have had money. But you might have not been able to be the type of mom that you were to her. But when guilt comes, guilt is like this narrow a vision and it doesn't let us see actually all of the goodness, it only shows us that one point of lack. And so it's this untruth that takes such a tapestry of goodness and shows us just, ah, see where that thread's starting to come unraveled? Instead of seeing the beautiful tapestry. You're listening to OTRFM. Part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 
1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Loving the divine. First of all, as you say, you've never been, you know, that attracted by various images or stories. That's okay. When we talk about loving the divine, even those of us in a tradition where we may have images, it's not the image itself we love. It's the one whom the image is an image of. So for example, if I hand you a random picture of a random man torn out of a magazine, and I say, love him, well, of course, you're going to find it very hard to love a picture of a random man you don't know torn out of a magazine. But if I hand you a picture of your father, It's going to be very easy to love him because it's your dad. And so when we are using images, it's not that we love the image. It's that we love the one who it's an image of. And the image reminds us of who it's of. And that's what it's about. So if you're looking at a piece of paper and that piece of paper happens to be a photograph of your mother or your father or someone else you love, through looking at that image, it's going to inspire loving you. But not because the piece of paper has inspired love. Because the piece of paper has triggered within you a love that already exists for the person who it's a picture of. In the same way, the images only work when we already love the one it's an image of. So if you don't, no problem, don't worry. Here's how you love the divine. Do you love anyone? Is there someone you love? Great. Now, how long have you loved that person? Fantastic. How old are you? 34. 34. Great. So let's say that you've consciously loved that person for 31 years. 32 years. Let's say that for the first couple of years, you were just sort of loving by instinct. 31, 32 years, you have consciously loved someone. How many times over 31, 32 years has the body of that person changed? There is no answer. The answer is constantly. The body is constantly changing. If you go back and you look at a picture of what that person looked like when you were a baby, and you look at what that person looks like now, they're going to be vastly different. The body continually changes. Skin cells are being sloughed off every day. Our organs are regenerating every day seven, eight, nine years. Literally every seven, eight, nine years, you have a brand new body. So the body keeps changing. But you've loved them continually. It wasn't that you say, ah, but I loved that body better. You've loved them continually. And what that means is, what you love is content not form. Now you might also love their body. You might also say, oh yeah, the body is beautiful. I love to hold their hands. I love to give them a hug or cry on their shoulder. 
But no matter how many times that body has changed, your love has stayed consistent, which means what you are loving is essence. What you're loving is content, not form. And the essence of everyone is divine. The core of everyone is divine. I could make it a little bit more visually morbid. Let's say we take this person you love, and bear with me in the midst of this imagery, but it's powerful for a reason. We take this person you love, and for whatever reason, tragically, God forbid, they have to have their hands amputated. Do you love them any less? Okay, then they have to have their arms amputated. Do you love them any less? Then they have to have their legs amputated. Do you love them any less? Now, we could go, again, as gruesomely morbid as this is, you could go slice by slice by slice through the torso, and there'd be no point at which you would say, okay, I no longer love them. Okay, the being I love no longer exists in this body in front of me. And what that means is that that which you love in them doesn't exist in the body. Otherwise, as we chopped off the body limb by limb, at some point you'd say, oh, now I no longer love them because what I loved has gone in that limb that's now been amputated. But what you love is spirit. What you love is soul. What you love is essence. It doesn't exist in the body. There's no part of that body that could be amputated that would make you say, ah, now I no longer love them. My love resided in that part of their body. Amazingly, when people develop dementia, and they're in t or they, they have a brain lesion, they get into an accident and their brain is damaged, their personality changes completely. Family still loves them. People who loved them still love them. It's not you have a new personality, I no longer love you. Literally, even the way that they act, the way they speak, the things they like, the things they don't like, what they, everything changes. We still love them. Which makes you realize that what you're loving isn't in anywhere in the body. It isn't anywhere in their brain. It isn't in how they behave. It isn't in what they say. You may prefer certain behaviors over others. You may prefer certain ways that they speak over others. But you love them regardless. What you love is soul. What you love is spirit. What you love is essence. doesn't matter what word we use. It's not a semantic issue, but you love that, that spirit of them, that isness of them. That's God. When we say the truth of who we are, the core of who we are, that spirit, that soul, that love, that truth is divinity. And when we agree that we're not going to fight on the semantics of it, that whether we call it God or we call it divinity or we call it soul or we call it spirit or we call it love or we call it truth or we call it essence, it doesn't matter. But that we're going to realize that we're all talking about the same thing. That isness, which is not your body, which is not your brain, which is not your thoughts, which is not your behaviors, but that just is. So if you can really love anyone, you're loving God. So don't worry. Yes, you're right. It's very abstract to just try to love God. Don't worry. Love someone. Love anyone. But love them so fully that when you're with them, do whatever you can to connect just to their essence instead of being focused on what they're doing or saying or how they're acting or how they're dressed or whether they gained or lost five pounds or whatever it may be. 
try to allow yourself to just focus on that essence of them. And the beautiful piece of that is, in order to connect with the soul of another being, you can only do it from the place of your soul. Thinking mind, judging mind, cannot connect to soul spirit consciousness. Intellect connects to, in, to intellect, body connects to body, we call it lust. Right? I mean, there's all the different connections we have body to body, brain to brain, thoughts to thoughts, behaviors to behaviors, preferences to preferences, right? We say, oh, we get along really well, we like the same things. Same value, same, great. Intellectually compatible. But in order to connect to the soul, only the soul can connect to the soul. So as you are connecting to the soul, spirit, essence, truth of another being, you're doing it from that place in you that is soul, spirit, essence, truth. And that's divinity connecting to divinity. When in India we fold our hands and we say namaste, it literally means the divinity within me is bowing to the divinity within you. The divine in me bows to the divine in you. So it's this constant remembrance. Divine in me bows to the divine in you. So begin with that. Begin with bowing to all. You don't have to bow to how they act, bow to how they speak, bow to anything about them other than the divine in them, from that place of the divine in you. And then love anyone fully, deeply, and your loving God. And then, in terms of, as you asked, why should we not hate God, given everything that's going on in the world? Well, that would be hating the wrong, the wrong being, unfortunately. That would be putting the blame where it doesn't belong. And here's why. So the core of who we are, as we've been talking, the soul, the spirit, the essence, that's divinity. But when we, when we were created, this infinite, divine, perfect, full, whole, undivided love, truth, soul came into this universe using this body. And then the mind misidentifies as the body instead of as soul. And when the mind misidentifies, when the mind forgets who it is, rather than remembering, ah, I'm soul, it thinks, ah, I'm body. Well, if I'm body, I am a certain color. I am a certain gender, I am a certain religion, I am a certain race, I am of a certain nationality. I have certain things. I don't have certain things. And when I look out and other people have what I don't have, I want them. I feel jealous, I feel envious, and then I engage in behaviors to snatch them or get them for myself in some way. And I allow these thoughts to grow in my mind of separation. And then I start to hate the people who have it. How dare they? Why don't I have a purse like that? Why don't I have a house like that? Why don't I have a car like that? And jealousy breeds, envy breeds. When I think I am this body, 
then I'm very territorial over that which is mine. And of course, I'm always looking to increase that which is mine because then who I am expands. Illusorily, of course, but this ignorance, this false identification with the body, if I can have more, then I feel like I am more. If I can have a lot of money, then I feel like I am a more important person. Have a lot of titles, have a lot of degrees, have a lot of power, have a lot of employees, have a lot of things. Look, I am more. Look, all this is me. Makes me feel like I am more. But it's rooted in ignorance. Because it's rooted in the ignorance that I am this body. That I am my role. That I am this drama I'm playing. The soul, the truth of who I am, is everything. So whether I've got 10,000 employees or whether I am one of 10,000 employees, either way, I'm infinite. I'm whole. I'm everything. When we have these beautiful, what we call sort of mool mantras, these core mantras, aham brahmasmi, so hum, they, they're just different ways of saying the same thing. I am that. I am the divine. And so that's who I am. But here's the dilemma. If I allow my mind to continue to identify as body, and therefore as my color, as my race, as my religion, as my nationality, as what I have, and therefore greed, envy, anger, bruise in me, my actions are going to follow suit. And so I'm going to engage in behaviors that are harmful, harmful to myself, harmful to others, harmful to the planet. But those behaviors are behaviors that I've engaged in out of ignorance. And here's the thing. When God created us for whatever reason, and I, I joke sometimes, half seriously, half jokingly, that I wonder whether God doesn't regret this particular part of the decision. But God gave us this thing called free will. And if I were God, I would seriously regret having done that. It would be like a parent that you buy your kids something that you think they're old enough for. Right? You think your kid is old enough for a chemistry set, and then he sets his brother on fire, and you realize, well, he wasn't perhaps quite old enough for that chemistry set. In the same way, I wonder whether God doesn't regret, in retrospect, having handed us this thing called free will. I don't know. But regardless, we have it. And that free will is what enables me to decide. I'm going to spend my life identifying as this body in its separateness, I'm going to believe that who I am is based on what I have, the money, the power, the things, as separate from others and that others are objects on my path, hurdles. Or I'm going to identify as the pure soul and I'm going to realize that who I am is love, is consciousness everything. And I'm going to spend my life focused on that. But I've got free will to make that decision. And that's the dilemma. But that's where what we call evil in the world. God didn't create a system of evil. If you look at nature, if you look at how nature works, And then you look at how humans work. You're able to understand exactly the role that free will plays in creating havoc and destruction. How many billions of years planet Earth survived beautifully? 
before humans came along. This is the underside of free will. But that's not God's fault. That's our fault. So don't hate God. Hate ignorance. Hate ego. Hate misuse of free will. Hate the illusion of separation. And ideally, don't hate anything. Begin, begin by being against those, but then slowly, slowly, slowly realize that that which you're feeling toward them is growing in you. See, if I'm going to share love, first I have to manufacture love. I cannot love you until I create love in me. If I'm an apple tree, I can only give you apples if I can grow them on my branches. I can't give you what I don't have. And so, you know, an air conditioner can only give you cold air. A heater can only give you hot air. It's all they have. And so, if I, if I'm going to love you, Well, first I have to generate love in me. In the same way, if I'm going to hate you, I have to generate hate from within me. And the problem with that is it eats me up first. It's like a science lab where I'm manufacturing poison. Well, I'm manufacturing it in my house. The fumes are going to kill me long before I get that poison out to kill somebody else. There's that beautiful saying that says anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. If I'm I'm angry at you or I hate you, I'm manufacturing this poison inside me. That anger, that hatred, I'm manufacturing it inside me. It's going to kill me long before it has any impact on you. And so if there are things in the world that would make you hate, whatever source it is that's making that happen, figure out how you can be a light. Right? It's like that beautiful saying of just, instead of cursing the darkness, be a light. How can you be a light? Yeah, there's darkness. And yeah, every one of us has the ability to be that light. And that's what we're called upon to do. There's a a beautiful teaching in the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna says, whenever there's darkness in the world, whenever darkness is winning out over light, whenever adharma, unrighteousness, is winning out over dharma, over righteousness, whenever evil is winning out over goodness, that's when I incarnate, inform, to restore light to the darkness, to restore dharma to the adharma. And then there's another beautiful teaching in which we're told actually in so many ways, in so many different scriptures, that the divine pervades all of us. And if you take those two teachings together, what you realize is we are. Every one of us is. That incarnation of the divine in form here right now to restore light to the darkness, to restore dharma to the adharma. That's what you're here for. But first you have to realize your light. And that's what you're here for. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. 
Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Should we try to love what we do or do what we love? Both. This is the how much of my current situation is in my hands, how much of it is not in my hands. Basically, a really good rule of life is that, that wonderful saying that says, Oh God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So if I don't love what I do, and I can change it, by all means, change it. But be sure that your love is not just a momentary, temporary fascination or enjoyment. Because then you're going to find yourself changing jobs every week. And this is true in relationships. This is true in so many aspects of our life. If you can change something about your situation that you are not loving, change it. There's no, there's no spiritual teaching that says, thou art be miserable. Thou shalt be miserable. It is more spiritual to be miserable than to be happy. There's no teaching like that. Thou shalt suffer. I've never, I've never heard a, teaching from the scriptures where God says that. Thou shalt hate every minute of thy life. I mean, can you imagine? Of course not. The scriptures are filled with teachings of, of courage, of stepping up to the plate of our life, of fulfilling our dharma. So, by all means, do what you love, but be very careful that when you're using the concept of what you love, that it's not the flavor of the moment. Because again, the ego in the mind is very fickle. And it will give you all sorts of reasons to stop loving. Whether it's a a class in school, it's harder than you thought it would be, a teacher who isn't so nice to you, somebody who sits next to you in class who 
for whatever reason, brings up things and you really don't want to be in that class. Or maybe it's a class that takes place at the same time as your favorite TV show and you'd actually rather be at home watching TV than in class. But the mind will create all sorts of rationalizations. Oh, it's a bad class, bad teacher, you don't need it, obsolete knowledge, you're meant for something different, useless information. Our mind will come up with all kinds of reasons. This job is beneath you. One day, you know, your boss asks you, to, asks you to do something that's a little hard or maybe doesn't praise you the way you'd like, maybe even scolds you a bit. Maybe suddenly you've got a coworker who's really smart, really good, it brings up all kinds of issues for you. whatever it may be. But the mind is going to tell you, oh, stupid job, bad company. Boss doesn't know what he's doing. I should be doing something better. And so then you find a different job. And then, of course, something happens there. You're passed over for a promotion that you thought you should get. The colleagues in the workroom go out for lunch and they don't invite you. Whatever it may be. You make a comment in a board meeting that was not so smart, somebody shuts you down. And again, the mind, instead of dealing with actually what comes up for these things, says, oh, Stupid job, don't like this job, got to find something that's better for me. I'm not fulfilling my potential. This company is better. They're moving much faster. They know where it's at. Then you keep moving. We do that with jobs. We do that with relationships. We do it with so much. So be really careful. People do it with gurus. They do it with all sorts of traditions, yogic traditions, religious traditions. Somebody doesn't butter me up the way I want to be buttered up, doesn't, doesn't tell me I'm quite as perfect as I think I am, points out a little bit of my ego to me that I don't necessarily really quite want to see. Oh, he's corrupt, she's corrupt, you know, whatever. This is, this is how the human mind works. So just before you leave your job, be really careful that this is not an ego reaction to something, but that it really is in alignment with you having a love that you can fulfill and that you can fulfill in a meaningful way and you know what that is. And that it's not just that the current job is too much work, they're forcing you to be more responsible than you'd like, they're forcing you to show up on time, you're kind of a late sleeper, they want you there at 8, you'd rather a job that started at 11. Just be careful. Because we lose a lot of really beautiful opportunities that the universe gives us, not just career opportunities, but growth opportunities in life. Because our ego talks us out of it. So be careful about that. But otherwise, if you're really sure it's not right for you, it's not who you are, absolutely no rule that you have to convince yourself how to love it. If you have the capacity to be doing something else that you do love, then do it. But if not, this is where the serenity part comes in. So give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. There are aspects of our life that we cannot change. We cannot go back and rewrite our childhoods. Cannot change your family of blood. 
cannot change a lot of aspects of our physical body. Some of it we can change, but lots of it we can't. Can't rewrite however many decades of life we've already spent creating different karma. That's the stuff we get the serenity for. That's the stuff we learn to love. Or if you don't actually love it, learn, love what you are learning through it. Love how you are growing through it. Love how you are blossoming through it. And if it's something you can change, that's where we have the courage to change. Because a lot of times we should make a change. But we don't. You see this a lot in women who are in relationships where they're being abused. Women who absolutely should change the situation. But for whatever reason, they don't. They can't. In many cases, they can't. And then the wisdom, of course, to know the difference. So that's where we meditate. It's to understand internally which aspects of this are the fruits of my karma and I'm really meant to just learn to love it or learn to love what I'm learning from it, learn to love how I'm growing through it, which aspects of it are the stuff that is molding me into who I'm supposed to be. You know, I frequently describe being a, a disciple of a guru, like being a lump of clay on a potter's wheel, where it doesn't always feel good. Potters don't always take their clay and go, let me, let me ever so gently and lovingly smooth you into the vase you're supposed to be or the bowl you're supposed to be. They take that lump of clay and they throw it onto a wheel and the wheel spins around and every once in a while they whack it. And then they take it and they throw it in the fire. But at the end of the day, you end up with something that's not only useful but beautiful. But it hasn't felt great all along the way. And so it's important to be able to have the clarity of knowing which of these situations are situations that I am absolutely supposed to change. Because really my stepping up to the plate is in having the courage to change this situation. And which situations are there where my stepping up to the plate is having the courage to sit there while I'm in the fire. The courage that the caterpillar has while it's being liquefied to be turned into a butterfly. And how to know. And that's where the wisdom comes in. And that wisdom, it's not something that there's an equation for. It's not something there's a cookie cutter answer for. But it's something that internally we have to know. And, and we do know. You know, Pooja Swamiji always talks about our internal GPS. And as long as we can make wisdom be the one behind the wheel, Or if we don't feel like we have enough wisdom yet, let us put seeking behind the wheel, yearning behind the wheel, humility behind the wheel, surrender behind the wheel, and just make sure that ego stays belted up in its seat in the back. And eventually we'll find the way. But ideally, the more you can learn to love whatever situation you're in, 
the better you're going to be. Not in a resigned way, not in a defeatist way, but simply in the way of wherever we are, it's perfect. This moment, this minute, wherever I am, it's perfect. How can I love this moment? Because my ability to love this moment is what lays the seeds for my ability to love the next moment and the moment after that. Chances are if I'm miserable right now, I'm going to be miserable five minutes from now and miserable tomorrow. So the more I can learn how to love in this moment, Chances are I'm going to be in love five minutes from now and tomorrow. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio.